Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. By Tandem Diabetes Care, makers of the T-Slim X2 Insulin Pump. And by Real Good Foods, real food you feel good about eating. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, a deep dive into low blood sugar, a frank talk about what hypoglycemia means, what the dangers are, how to treat, and more. I'll tell my patients, I know you want to go to the pantry and eat till you feel better, or drink till you feel better, or go to the refrigerator and eat and drink till you feel better. And you can do that. Your blood sugar is going to come up, obviously. But then you're going to go from feeling crappy at 52 or whatever, 48, to feeling really yucky again now over 300 probably. Shannon Johnson is a certified diabetes educator who lives with diabetes herself. Plus, we'll find out about the Taking Control of Your Diabetes Conference, the first one for people with diabetes and not just medical professionals started 25 years ago. Great conversation with founder Dr. Steve Edelman, who was diagnosed as a teen. And tell me something good. They've done it. You can now loop with Omnipod. If you're not familiar, we'll explain exactly what that means and why it's so significant. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome to Diabetes Connections. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. We aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection. My son was diagnosed when he was not yet two years old, way back in 2006. He is now 14, almost 14 and a half at this point. He's in eighth grade. My husband lives with type 2 diabetes. I don't have diabetes. I have a background in broadcasting in local radio and television, and that's how you get the podcast. We are now, what is this, last day of April as you're listening here, and that means tomorrow is May, which means it is the month that my daughter graduates from high school. Oh, my goodness. Uh, You know, I talk about Benny, of course because this is a diabetes show, and he's the one with type 1. But my daughter, Leah, is a senior in high school. She's graduating. And sure, it's bittersweet. I mean, I'm a little sad about it. But man, I am so excited for her. She is ready. She's very independent. You know, she's just doing great. And so I'm sure I'll be crying to you a little bit this month and over the summer as we get ready (laughs) to send her off to college. But I also hope to share a lot of the excitement as well. I'm going to two conferences this month. I am going to the Touched by Type 1 conference. That's in Orlando. I'm going to be speaking and doing some good stuff there, moderating a panel as well. And I'm going to the Taking Control of Your Diabetes conference. More about that, of course, later in the show. They've got one in Raleigh, not too far from my neck of the woods here in North Carolina. So I'm going to head over to that and check it out. Not speaking at that one. I just want to go get the lay of the land. I haven't been to a TCOYD conference yet. So I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a busy month, but I say that every month, right? You do too, right? When are we not busy? (laughs) Hey, no spoilers. Avengers Endgame. I'm going to say more at the end of the show. I promise. No spoilers even then, but I'm going to put it at the end just in case you really don't want to hear anything. But, you know, if you heard me talk about how the Hulk has helped us explain diabetes to Benny, especially how to handle those those moods and the crankiness you get with high blood sugar. I talked about that last week and I blogged about it if you read the blog. All I'm going to say is that the Hulk in this movie, in Endgame, did it again. I I can't wait to tell you more about that at the end of the show. So that's later on. Also, a quick follow up. If you follow me on social media, you saw that we did a Facebook Live uh, last week and I talked at the end about going to the endo. And I mentioned last week as well that we have an endo appointment coming up. I got Benny to talk to me and it takes a little time to edit those interviews. (laughs) So I'm going to put that in next week's show. And no spoilers here. Um, and you know, I don't share specific numbers about him. I think at this point in his life that that's his business. And I, I just don't feel like it's something that I'll do. And I'll explain more about that next week when we talk more about Benny's endo visit. I do want to tell you, though, that as the, the Dexcom predicted, amazingly good news. Over the last six months, using basal IQ and using a shot of long-acting insulin once a day along with the insulin pump that we use, the T-Slim X2, it has been phenomenal. And we are back to pre-puberty time in range. I just laugh because he loves that I'm telling everybody that he's in puberty all the time. I mean, he's resigned to it. But I wish there were a better word for that. The teen years, it's all bad all around. 
bottom line, it's worked amazingly well. I will tell you more about that next week. I'll let Benny tell you more about it next week. But man, we have seen some really good stuff lately. Okay, a reminder, the interview with Shannon Johnson about Lowe's This is a highly edited version. As we've been doing all year long with these extra episodes, we will release the full interview all by itself. So you can take a deep dive later this week. Maybe I shouldn't use the words a deep dive like I did previously for low blood sugars, but you know what I mean. I have been thrilled with the response to this extra series. Um, We are getting much closer to the series. We're getting closer to making another announcement about it to help you get more of this resource. And by the way, if you love your endo or your CDE or a healthcare provider who's knowledgeable about diabetes, let me know. I'm always looking for experts. It's kind of fun not to hear the same voices all the time. So if you've got somebody that you'd like for the extra episodes, you know, these focused uh, one topic on diabetes management, reach out in the Facebook group or hit me up on an email. And the Facebook group, of course, is diabetes. Diabetes Connections, the group. And I'm at Stacy, S T A C E Y, at diabetes connections.com. All right, and Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. You know, when you have a toddler diagnosed with type 1, as of course we did, you hear rumblings for a long time about the teen years. Oh my. And when it hit us full force, and it was a little early, Benny, he started all this teen puberty nonsense early, I'd say between ages 10 and 11. I was so glad we had Dexcom. Benny's insulin needs started going way up. Uh, He has grown, I don't know how many inches, I want to say... At this point, I think it's eight, maybe nine in the last three years. And along with the hormone swings, I can't really imagine managing diabetes during this time without the Dexcom continuous glucose monitoring system. We react more quickly to highs and lows. We see trends. We adjust dosing with advice from our endo. I know using the Dexcom G6, no doubt, has helped improve Benny's A1C and overall health. If your glucose alerts and readings from the G6 do not match symptoms or expectations, use a blood glucose meter to make diabetes treatment decisions. To learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. My guest this week is an expert in diabetes in a bunch of ways. First, and probably most importantly, she lives with it. Shannon Johnson was diagnosed with LADA in her early 20s. We've talked about LADA before, and she's going to explain more of that in the interview. It prevents very slowly. You manage it almost exactly like type 1 diabetes eventually. Shannon is also a CDE and a pump and CGM trainer. So let's get to it and talk about Lowe's. Shannon, thanks for spending some time with me today. I think this is a really interesting topic that we think we know about, but I'm I'm really interested to learn more. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Well, it's always great to talk to somebody who's had the amount of healthcare experience that you have because, you know, you talk to people, you train people in the pumps and the CGMs and everything, but to actually live with it as well just gives that other layer of understanding. So, so let's just jump right in because when I talk about low blood sugars and, you know, hypo, I think we all think we know what we're talking about. But, you know, I've learned in these deep dive episodes that even after 12 years, I'm just scratching the surface. So let's just start with the basics. You know, when we say somebody has a low blood sugar, what's happening in the body? An actual low blood sugar is a blood sugar of below 60. However, we like to start treating it and start teaching people to treat it when it starts to become below 70. There's a couple of things that's happening when you actually have a hypoglycemic episode. One is you have too much insulin for whatever reason, whether it's you took too much insulin for your carbs or you got maybe some extra exercise or you uh, skipped a meal and you had already taken your insulin. But for some reason, you have too much insulin and then you don't have enough glucose or sugar in your body to use that insulin because The insulin is like a key. That's what we use to get the glucose to the cells to be used for energy. So if we have extra insulin going there in throughout the body, then our glucose can't get to where it needs to go because we don't have enough. So that's when you start to feel shaky. You might feel drowsy, might not feel real clear headed, those kinds of things. And then your body lets you know what's going on most times. I guess in people who don't have diabetes, their bodies are, are grabbing that extra or emergency glucose that they can. But when you have right. type one, you don't have those sources. You know, I've heard that it starts in your body and then it, it kind of goes to grab the glucose from your brain. I mean, does that even make sense? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, because our body uses lots and lots of glucose. Our, our liver stores glucose for times when we need that. And so when, you know, it, our body gives us as much as it can um, afford to, and then to the point where it can't give it any more, it's told not to do that. So then that's when we start to feel those, those lower uh, blood sugar symptoms. How exact are the numbers? You know, you mentioned below 70s when you start to treat, below 60s when it's really low. But sometimes, you know, my understanding is that the lower the blood sugar reading on a meter is, or even on a CGM, you know, the less accurate it is. And the same thing for the highs. You know, when you get to the extremes, it's less accurate. So is it true? And should we be concerned about that? Well, the FDA will approve uh, a system as long as the values that they're getting anywhere from 99 or excuse me 95 percent of the time to 99 percent of the time the values have to be within the lab values 20 percent either way so what that means is so let's say you check your blood sugar on your meter and it says 190 it's still considered accurate if it's 152 or up to 228 on your meter so even though the lab says 190 it's still considered accurate so when your blood sugars are higher, because the number is higher, that 20%, you know, is whether it's lower or higher than your lab number is quite extensive. It's, there's more space in between your 20%. But when you have, let's say, a 70, your 20% below is 56 and your higher is 84. So it's not quite as inaccurate Got it. as your higher. I used to get really concerned about that. I thought, you know, 20%, that's huge. Living with type 1 diabetes, if I only take 0.25 units or whatever, I just, I used to think that was not acceptable. But then I started looking at it and started thinking about it. You know, if I, let's say again, I check a blood sugar and it comes up of 190 and actually it could be 152 to 228 with my correction scale, am I really going to do anything that much different? If it's 152 as opposed to 190, probably not. So that's how I kind of have come to accept that discrepancy. So I get this all the time. You know, as you get older, when you have type 2 especially, you make less and less insulin. Everybody does. That's just the way of the, of the body. Mm. So I hear several times, all the time, I don't think my meter's working. I don't think my meter's working. So that's the first thing they think of. So the only way that you really can tell if that meter is accurate is when you check a blood sugar, have a lab draw the blood sugar as well, and then compare it to that lab draw. And if it's within 20% either way, then your meter is accurate. We've also learned to kind of go off feelings, if that makes sense, you know, because sometimes Benny, my son, he can be 65 and feel great, but then he can be like 95 and say, I'm low and I need to treat. And he's almost always right, even if the arrow mm -hmm. isn't showing up on the Dexcom up or down. Do you find a lot of, of people and yourself, does that make sense that at some numbers, sometimes you feel okay, and at other times when you should be, quote, in range, you're really, mm -hmm. you're not? Yeah, sometimes I'll sit down to like eat a meal and check my blood sugar and it'll say, you know, 52. And I'm like, wait a minute, I don't feel 52. <laughs> and my sensor is not saying 52, you know, or my arrows aren't going down. So I'll check it again. Just I always double check to make sure if I have a question. But yeah, I've had that happen. And then other times I feel like I'm low and I'm not low. So I, I always want to make sure that I know what my blood sugar is with the meter. I think one of the things that's happening is it's just the rate of change of your sugar. Mm. You know, you could be dropping very quickly at 60 and maybe you're going to just, or you have just dropped from, let's say, 90 to 60 very quickly and your body is just telling you that you're dropping or you have dropped quickly. And maybe your 95 is a little bit more stable or slowly dropping or slowly rising. So I think that's the difference that um, one can feel, uh, that little rate of change. Again, this may sound like a silly question, but why are lows dangerous? You know, can you talk to me about, we mentioned what's going on in the body, but, you know, why is it something to be concerned about and to treat quickly? Well, our bodies have to have glucose for energy and to continue, you know, our brain function, our heart function, everything that functions needs glucose. And so if your insulin levels are high and your sugar levels are low, then your vital organs are not getting what they need and they start to deteriorate. And, you know, eventually it can lead to, and that's why, you know, if you start not having enough sugar for the brain, that's where you start with the loss of consciousness and then maybe into a seizure and then maybe even to a coma. 
So that's the part that we worry about with the lows. The other thing, um, as people get older, not just our, our kids, but we have, you know, an older population now that is becoming more, more and more type ones. We have to worry about when their blood sugars are low, that can cause some arrhythmias in their heart. Mm. And their hearts are very fragile, you know, 79 years old, 82 years old. So we want to make sure that we really, really avoid the lows with those people. And as a matter of fact, we teach them, you know, we drill in their head, your A1C has to be less than seven. But then as they get older, we have to change that behavior Uh. and actually try and get it a little bit higher. We keep them around seven and a half to eight percent. And that's really difficult for them. Well, you told me I have to be, you know, less than 7% all the time. And now you're telling me I have to be higher. That doesn't make sense. So then we have an opportunity for education there. But there's lots of different things that can happen from those low blood sugars. Yeah, I've actually, I heard very recently some statistic about as as we get older and, and, you know, many people feel their lows less, that many people over the age of 65 are spending more time under 70 which, you know, mm-hmm. they, they don't want to do, you know, how do you get people to, is it just checking more often, you know, CGM? How do you try to tell your older people to pay more attention to it or avoid it? Right back to Shannon and getting her answer to that in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneTouch. For seven years, OneTouch Vario test strips have delivered reliable results you can trust. And did you know that they have the lowest copay on the most health plans and are always covered on traditional Medicare Part B? To upgrade today to the OneTouch Vario Flex Meter, visit diabetes-connections.com and click on the OneTouch logo. Coverage and payment may be subject to coinsurance, deductible, and patient eligibility requirements. LifeScan does not guarantee coverage or payment. Now back to Shannon talking about feeling lows and the aging process. Yeah, because, you know, as you get older, and especially if they've had really, really tight control, that ability to feel those lows, because maybe they've had so many or they're, you know, everything declines as you get older, it becomes kind of a mystery to them. Like, well, this has never happened to me in the past. So that is one of the best things that ever came out of Medicare is the coverage of the CGM. So all of our, pretty much all of our type ones, older, in the older generation especially, are on CGM. Wow. And, you know, there's several different types out there or, you know, different uh, systems out there. There we go. Available. But the one that we prefer is the Dexcom for our older folks, just because it, it will alert them if they have lows or if they're trending down. And especially if they don't feel them, then they will get that alert. So other systems, not quite so much, will do that. But we really, really use a lot of Dexcom here. Type 2s, we use the Libre a little bit more, but uh, the Dexcom is one of our favorites. And so Medicare just started covering that for those folks, and then they can only have the G5 right now, but it, hopefully they can get the G6 soon now that it's been approved. And I mean, sensors are just game changing, whether you're, you know, two years old or, you know, 82 years old, not checking quite as much, being able to see where your blood sugars are. When I first started working with sensors, I always told people, well, you know, because they had to calibrate, they don't have to do that so much anymore. But when they had to, I had to kind of help them through, why would I want this system? And I just would compare it to like an insurance policy or a GPS system. Because right now, without the arrows telling me where I'm at, if I get into a car and my blood sugar is 99 and I'm going to take a trip three hours away, how do I know what if I'm going to make it right. You know, without a low, low blood sugar or if I'm going to have a high blood sugar? So that was kind of like how I compared my GPS system. This is telling me where I'm going. I'll know if I'll make it there without a snack or I'll know if I need to, uh, to take a snack. And then it's also... I compared it to an insurance policy, whereas now you have a little bit more leniency to check those blood sugars and make sure that you have something that's backing you up as well. But they've evolved a lot since then. So they're, they're only getting better. It's great. No, we are, we are thrilled. Obviously, we, we've used Dexcom for several years, and it's it really has been a game changer all around. You know, you mentioned seizure and coma and things like that. And, you know, I, I don't, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but this is an episode about low blood sugar. So let's talk about that if we could. The risk of seizure, again, I'm a lay person, seems different for different individuals. You know, I know people, mostly parents of children with type 1, whose, whose child has had a seizure, and it hasn't always been because of a low blood sugar. It hasn't happened at a number that you'd expect. And then I know many, 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 many more. I mean, I have 600 parents in my local 
Facebook group, whose children mm-hmm. have been 20 and 25, 17, and not had a seizure. Right. Can, can you speak right. to what's going on there? Yep, we had a type 1 of several years walk into the clinic with a blood sugar of 19. Mm. <laughs> Just yeah. totally, because we check a blood sugar every time somebody comes in. Totally talking, alert. You know, he was starting to get a little ornery, but he was fine. But then as time went on, he couldn't remember being that low. So the threshold is different for each individual. You can see somebody has a 10 blood sugar and they recover very well. Somebody else might have a 32 and they are just deathly afraid of ever getting that low again. But it's just dependent upon the threshold of where their brain is is saying, okay, I need more sugar and I'm not getting it. And then that, you know, will put them into that seizure. As you have more lows, you know, you don't get those early signs and symptoms um, if you're used to getting several lows. So it might be, you know, that you're getting to uh, not getting the the early signs and it's getting to the later signs a little bit um, quicker than what you think it is. But it's just your whole body, your brain is just really needing that sugar and it's everybody's individual. Okay, so let's talk about how to treat low blood sugar because it's simple, but it's not that simple. I was amazed I remember, and I'll go back to that first story. I think my son was 52 or some crazy number when he was stumbling on the playground. And we, you know, we ran and we got the juice and we got everything we needed. And then I called the endo because we were three weeks in. And I said, okay, what else do I have to do? And they said, what do you mean? Like his blood sugar was 120. He was fine. He felt good. He was kind of hungry. You know, I think Uh we got him some lunch. But they said, you don't have to do anything. And I, I right. was amazed. It was the power of this simple sugar. I was like, this is a miracle drug. You know, and all it was was <laughs> juice. But he was fine. And to me, it was absolutely amazing. But it's not really that simple. Can you explain how we're supposed to treat low blood sugars? Well, what we teach our people, our, our patients, is the rule of 15. Just, it's kind of an easy, you know, when your blood sugar is low, you're not thinking very clearly. And your body is, is starving. It needs sugar. So it's telling you to eat, eat, eat. And so, you know, I'll tell my patients, I know you want to go to the pantry and eat till you feel better or drink till you feel better or go to the refrigerator and eat and drink till you feel better. And you can do that. Your blood sugar is going to come up, obviously. But then you're going to go from feeling crappy at, you know, 52 or whatever, 48, to feeling really yucky again now over 300 probably from everything that you've eaten. So it does take longer. And that's, um, I think people don't like it because it does take longer. But it's the say again, there's that safe word. It is the safe way of bringing that blood sugar up and getting you back to uh, feeling better, of course. So the rule of 15 is, is our common rule. Of course, you can change that a little bit based on the age of the child or the adult. Children don't need as much sugar because they don't have as much blood and mass, so they don't really need as much sugar. But typically, a good rule of thumb has been um, the rule of 15. So what you do is you check your blood sugar, and then if it's less than 70, you're going to treat it with the 15 grams of fast-acting carbs. That's when people, you'll hear, that's when I get to have my Snickers, or that's when I get to have my M&Ms, or, you know, well, that's all good and, and great. That's not the best time to do that, because actually chocolate doesn't work as well right. as, say, like a Lifesaver would, just because of the fat content. It takes longer. It'll work, but it's going to take longer, and we want to bring that sugar up. So the best thing that works is a liquid, like maybe four ounces of juice, whether it's orange juice, grape juice, regular soda works well. But I always encourage my patients to carry the glucose tablets because they're portable. You tend not to cheat on them. You know, if you have a a bag of Skittles sitting in the bottom of your purse, you might tend to see those and take a few here and there. So you're not going to do that with glucose tablets. They have lots of different flavors. But what I find is people don't take enough. So I come to the clinic and yeah, I had a low blood sugar last week. And then I took one glucose tablet. And then later that night, I was low again. Well, they didn't bring that blood sugar up high enough. Mm. So one glucose tablet has about four grams of carb in it. So literature says about three to five. I always tell them to do four. That's 16 grams. And then you can refill them as you need to. Any pharmacy has those. Uh, It's really easy. They're portable. So that's typically what we do. So you would take do the 15 grams of fast-acting glucose. And then this is the hardest part. You got to stop what you're doing, wait 15 minutes, and then check it again. 
and it doesn't matter, and I have to tell people this all the time, it doesn't matter if you eat 15 grams of carb or 50 grams of carb, it's still going to take you 15 minutes before you start to feel better because that's how long it takes for sugar to get to your bloodstream. Mm. So then after that 15 minutes of waiting, then you check it again. And if it's come up above 70, that's good. Then you want to eat something like a sandwich or you know something like that. If not, then you want to treat it again. You do the 15 grams, wait 15 minutes and treat it again. So sometimes when you're not thinking very clearly because of the low, that's a little bit easier to grasp. Let's talk about emergency treatment for lows. Let's touch on glucagon and how that works and, and what we're supposed to do. First, let's start out by, as you listen, you're probably familiar. This is a red or orange, you know, emergency kit, and you've got to have a couple of steps to put it together. Your endocrinologist or your educator probably has had you practice once or twice, mm -hmm. hopefully. But okay. what does the glucagon do? Shannon, let's talk about what it's actually doing in the body, because it's not a sugar shot, right? You're not putting glucose in your body. Right, exactly. So one of the jobs that it's doing is uh, the liver is storing the sugar or a glucagon in your uh, in the liver. So for times when you need glucose, so a person without diabetes, you know, when they have the fight or flight response, your body needs this surge of energy. We get the energy from sugar, but if you're not eating anything at the time, you have to get it from somewhere. And one of those places is the liver. So when you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, the liver's not working the way it should be, and the pancreas is, lots of things because it's multi-systems, just not working as well as they should be. They're not talking to each other. So what happens then is you take the glucagon. When you have a low blood sugar, your liver has given you sugar, but it's given you as much as it wants to give you that it can because mm. it doesn't want to give you all of it. So when you take the glucagon, what you're doing is you're just telling the, the liver to release all that it has in it that it can possibly give. Okay. The, and it does the, the muscles, any, any kind of sugar, it's going to tell you to put it into the bloodstream. So that's what the glucagon does. Fortunately, I've never had to have a glucagon shot, so I don't really know what that feels like. Mm. But I have heard that you don't feel well, and I'm sure you don't. It's probably, you know, just the opposite of just kind of like when you uh, eat a whole bunch of food for a low, you don't feel really well. So what I teach my patients, I always teach the significant other, the mom or the dad, you know, I'll show it to the patient, but they're really very rarely going to use it. So I usually show it to um, the support person and teach them how to use it. I always tell them to put them on their side if they have to, if the patient's unconscious, give them the shot, put them on their side because, you know, a lot of times people will throw up when they uh, start to feel better. Then they have to get something to eat. I mean, they just really don't don't feel well, but uh, that's what that uh, medication is for. Mm -hmm. That's the worst case scenario. You know, blood sugar, somebody finds you unconscious, they give you the glucagon, somebody else has to administer. Um, usually, we give about half the dose for kids who are between like 5 and 16 or 5 and 15. We'll only give them the half, half the dose. We'll give anybody over 15 usually the full dose. And then the little guys, we use about a third of the dose. So like 30 units for a little guy, five or less, 50 for um, five to 15. And then over 15, we will give them the 100 units of that. I want to ask you about alcohol and low blood sugars, because mm -hmm. my understanding is that you've got to really change the way you treat them. Can you speak to that? Alcohol is or can be very difficult because some of it will raise blood sugars. But what happens is we worry when somebody's on insulin or, or medication is the, the early AM lows. Your body, when it's busy um, processing the alcohol, because alcohol gets used, I guess. I is, it process? the word. is it processed? Very maybe? Processed, yeah. Yeah, it gets processed by your liver. Just like some medications will, alcohol is, gosh, I wish I could think of the word. Anyway, it does get processed through the liver. So when it's busy doing that, then it can't, if your blood sugar happens to get low, then then it can't give you uh, the sugar that it's storing. So that's how those lows tend to come about because it's too busy working on the alcohol and not being able to do two things at once by giving you the sugar. So then that's when people get low. So what we recommend, what I always recommend, of course, check your blood sugars. Sensors help a lot too. I mean, they really, really will tell on you <laughs> if you drink. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I always tell people, have something to eat. You know, take a little insulin if you have to, but have something to eat with your, your alcohol. And of course, they'll say, well, can I have nuts 
well, you can, but it's not going to do anything. So I encourage them to have before they go to bed, maybe just a cracker with a little bit of peanut butter on it or a cracker with a little bit of cheese. It doesn't take much, but you got to have something there in case that alcohol is metabolized. There's the word. (laughs) (laughs) The alcohol is being metabolized by your liver. I strongly encourage them to obtain um, medical ID. A lot of people will say, well, I have my pump. Well, you know, not everybody knows what an insulin pump is. Um, or I have an ID card. Well, when a paramedic finds you unconscious, they're not going to go rummaging through your purse to see an ID card. So I I strongly encourage people to get a bracelet or a necklace because that's typically where they're going to look. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to have your doctor's name or anything. All it has to say is diabetes so that they will at least have some inclination to uh, at least check a blood sugar or give you glucagon or something that they can do. That's, I think, something that we as practitioners miss a lot for our patients is to tell them that. Um, But I think it's very, very important, especially as a kid. And then the other thing that I also tell patients is, especially if they're going on a pump, is does somebody around you know you have diabetes? And with kids, that's a little bit difficult because they don't want to be different and other kids think it's contagious that they're going to catch it, those types of things. But I I strongly encourage that they find somebody or have somebody that they know knows that they have diabetes. So if they are acting, you know, not themselves, they can hopefully quickly act on that. Well, Shen, thank you so much for spending so much time with me today. I'd love to have you back on. This was really informative and it was fun to talk to you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. You can hear the entire interview with Shannon later this week in our extra bonus episode. We will talk about being hypo unaware using mini glucagon doses and what exactly that is. And my weird experiences with low blood sugar. Uh, yeah, I don't have diabetes and more. I mean, there's probably another 20. 25 minutes, maybe 35 minutes of that interview. So I I hope you, you tune in and listen to Shannon later this week. In our community connection this week, TCOYD, taking control of your diabetes. Community Connection is brought to you by Tandem Diabetes Care, makers of the T-Slim X2 insulin pump. Now, I had heard about TCOYD for many years now. You know, I see their posts and I know people who've gone to conferences, but I actually didn't realize how many years they've been going on. It's 25 years. Now, there are two very close to me this year. So I'm going to be going to Raleigh. As I said, that's May 11th. And then they'll be here in Charlotte in November. So I'm really excited about that because they've never been here. I invited the founder, Dr. Steve Edelman, on to tell me what's unique about TCOYD. Dr. Edelman, thank you so much for making some time for us and for joining me. I'm so excited to learn more about TCOYD. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks for asking me. And please... uh please refer to me as Steve. I'm a first name basis kind of person anyway. And yeah, I'm excited to be on uh, your podcast. All right. So there's a lot to talk about here just in terms of what this conference is and more information, but let's kind of dial back and talk about you. I think many people in the diabetes community are familiar with you. I don't know if they're familiar with your story, but would you mind for people who don't know you, just tell me a little bit about your history because you've been living with type one since you were a teenager. Yes, Stacey. All right, I'm going to make a long story short. I'm going to start <laughs> off in the beginning. I was born, I got type 1 when I was 15, and as I went through school at UCLA, I said, I want to be a diabetes specialist. So I did train at the Jawson Clinic in Boston. I did research in San- UC San Diego, where I'm still on faculty, and really did a lot of professional education. And it dawned on me one day that it's really tough to educate primary care doctors and regular doctors about diabetes and to change their practice habits. So I was telling someone today, I thought of the idea for TCOID in the shower, a lot of my ideas, and I said, I want to put on a conference directly to the people most affected by this condition, and that's the people with diabetes and their significant others, their loved ones. So I put on our first Taking Control of Your Diabetes conference for people with diabetes in 1995, and I I was just going to do one a year. I mean, I got two full-time jobs, had a young family. And I said, I'm just going to do one in San Diego every year. But it was so impactful. and People were so thirsty for information because back then, no one put on conferences for people with diabetes. They just did healthcare professionals. And that was the beginning of TCOID. And now we're October 12th. uh, We're going to be putting on our 25th annual in San Diego. And 
Also, May 11th, we're going to be in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina for probably our seventh or eighth TCOID there over the past several years. And you've got conferences really all year long. We'll, we'll put up all the information at diabetes-connections.com. But, you yep. know, in 1995, I'm trying to think, did we even have email common then? I mean, you know, it's you hard know to think about think now, so. but yeah, I don't think so either. How did you get the word out? I mean, you were local in San Diego, but, you know, yeah. I'm curious if you worried that no one would come. Well, uh, you know, you're right. Social media was not even then. And your listeners may be laughing at me because I, back then we had 35 millimeter slide projectors. Right. You know, and we used to put all the talks in those little round carousels. You know, it was the usual traditional marketing that we actually still do these today, mainly because there's a lot of older folks that really not on social media and they're not online. Yeah. Now, our conferences, I should just say that our big conferences, like the one we're going to do in Raleigh, we have a type one track and type two track. So most of the type ones are pretty savvy. So we do social media. We, we try to market the conferences any way we can. We have a very low budget. So we print up brochures even. We get mailing with stuff like that. And I, I, one other thing, you know, one, we didn't start off with separating a type one and type two track and then quickly learn that type one and type two folks, we do have a lot in common because we all have high blood sugars, but there are many differences in how we get diagnosed, treatment, and also the mindset, the age. And so it's been very much more successful having both types of tracks. You know, we've talked about that a lot over the years here on the show, just in terms of, you know, some people who really want to separate the types, they want different names, you know, they don't want to be together at all. Other people who really feel that there's a lot more in common and that we are stronger together. And I fall in that latter camp. But I'm curious, having a conference where you have people with type one and type two, give us your perspective on that. Do they mix at the conferences? I mean, there are differences, but as you say, there's so much we have in common. Yeah. You know what? The way we orchestrate the conference is that the opening session where it starts at 9 and it goes to 10.30, and we have really impactful speakers, and I work very hard on my opening presentation. We got Bill Polonsky, that I call him the touchy-feely guy, <laughs> and the audience includes, if you can believe this, like all like 1,500, type 1s, type 2s, significant others, and we call them the type 3s, and we also have an ongoing, concurrent, continuing medical education program for healthcare providers, and that's a whole another topic where we put healthcare professionals in the same learning environment as the people with diabetes they have their own room, but for certain parts of the day, including this opening session, they're in the room. And I give the opening presentation and I pretty much talk about there's a lot of things that are quite different between folks with type 1 and type 2. Everything from physical appearance and misperceptions to therapies and prevention strategies. But we're all blood brothers in a way. And I think as time goes on, Stacy. It's amazing how much of our therapies and technologies are starting to blend. For example, continuous glucose monitoring. It previously thought to be just for type 1s, and now with Alibre and other companies, it's going to be the standard for type 2s one of these days. And of course, us type 1s are stealing the type 2 meds like yeah. SGLT2 inhibitors, like the GLP-1 receptor agonists, you know, Victoza and Vulcana, drugs like that. So I do think that we all have to embrace each other, but the big but in our conferences, we have a whole separate set of workshops for the type ones and the type twos. And what we do is the, we have a motivational speaker at the end of the day at 4.30, and I believe in North Carolina, it's going to be Carrie Sparling. You probably have had her on the show, sure. a blogger, and she addresses all the folks that came that whole day, the healthcare professionals, the type ones, type twos, and we kind of give a motivational speech that's not really one type one or type two oriented. So I think it's uh, important to have some of that together, but also realize there's different needs. I'm curious too, you, you mentioned the healthcare providers. I love our healthcare providers. We're very fortunate, but they don't seem to spend a lot of time mingling with patients. Are they at all intimidated by coming to something like this? Do you ever get a reaction from them? Like, oh my God, I'm in the same room with all these people. I would say the patients are more intimidated, but let me just tell you about my favorite hour of the day. One of my favorite hours, which is it's a workshop where we bring in patients and professionals in the same room. Now, I told you the healthcare professionals get their own lectures in their own room that's on oral agents, injectables, et cetera. But this one workshop, we sometimes call it fun names like diabetes police and diabetes <laughs> criminals, you know, developing a good relationship with your healthcare professional. And what we do the first 20 minutes, and we're going to do it in Raleigh and Charlotte later on in the year, 
is that the first 20 minutes, we just say to the healthcare professionals, you can't really say anything for the next 20 minutes. You just have to listen. And we turn to the patients, the people with diabetes, and we say, what does your healthcare professional do that drives you crazy? Oh, wow. What just, and it said, all your comments have to be negative because we do have a 20 minute ending session where it's a big kumbaya. We come together again and we get all kinds of of comments like they spend three minutes with me. They say I can only discuss one problem. They don't know what medications I'm on. They browbeat me for not testing my blood sugar and they call me non-compliant. And then the next 20 minutes, we ask the healthcare professionals to say, what are your patients with diabetes that drive you crazy? And I cannot tell you how ugly it gets. Uh, They lie. They cheat. They don't have any ownership. You know what the certified diabetes educators say? So many people do not show up for their appointment and they don't have the decency to call up and cancel ahead of time. Oh, that's very common. And the healthcare providers say they don't know what medications they're on. And it's really funny to me because the patients say that and the doctors say that, you know, who's responsible? And they say they don't take ownership. One provider got up there in front of a group of patients and honestly said in front of all these patients, I tell my patients not to eat ice cream, but I know they go home and eat ice cream all night, (laughs) you know, and no, I'm serious, Stacey. Oh, my God. I thought he was going to be lynched. Then the last 20 minutes, we come together. And the bottom line is healthcare professionals went in the field to help people. Sure. And people with diabetes want to live a long and healthy life. And both sides are saying the same thing about the other side. They don't care. And I think what you just mentioned, it was very insightful. Part of the problem is our system. When doctors are given 15 minutes to see a patient with diabetes and discuss all their other medical mm-hmm. problems, fill out the paperwork, it gets so impersonal. And if your patients don't have trust in you as a healthcare provider, and if you don't give empathy back, it's going to be a terrible doctor-patient relationship. So I can tell you there's not that many adult people with diabetes that are extremely happy with their caregiver and the caregiver system. Wow, that's a whole other show. I'm definitely going to follow Mm -hmm, up on that. mm -hmm. That is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to have you back on to talk about a lot of these issues and and talk more in depth about what you've seen over the years. But I I would like to ask you, you mentioned it's been 25 years since you started TCOYD, and you've already mentioned a few things that have changed, you know, technology, some of these other medications. What hasn't changed? Okay. I mean, it's kind of a frustrating question. I don't mean to be negative. No, the answer is negative, unfortunately. Kate. You would be shocked, and I actually show this at the conference to the participants. Okay, you've mentioned we've had tons of technology, CGMs, insulin pens and pumps, all the new nine different classes of oral medication for type 2s, all the injectables, the newer insulins, inhaled insulin. Now, here's the answer to your question. What hasn't changed? When you look at the percent of people in this country with an A1C less than 7, which is the standard goal, it hasn't changed in 10 years, about 50%. Now, people with type 1, it's only 30%. Type 1 is a tougher condition to keep under 7. And then you might ask, what is the reason for that? And that's a topic of a whole other show. Sure. But that's the sad state of affairs, and there's a whole bunch of reasons. But if I can be positive, what hasn't changed? What hasn't changed is the need for education, and I think education is power, And I think anybody that's educated about their own diabetes, they're living with their diabetes 24-7. They see their doctor 15 minutes, three or four times a year at most. The person that's most knowledgeable is going to do the best. That hasn't changed. You were diagnosed as a teenager. And in just reading about you and learning more, you were, at the time, given those instructions of, you know, one shot of insulin, test your your urine, try to guess the best you can. Do you think that 15-year-old would be surprised to see how far you've gone with this and how many other people oh, you've helped? Oh, oh, gosh. They would be surprised because, <laughs> you know, I'm an adult endo, but I do sort of consult with parents that have young kids that come down with diabetes. And I, I promote get a CGM in the first 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And so just having that, you know, versus urine, we never, when you said guess, uh, we, we just gave the same dose. One, If you could imagine one shot a day. So I think... I don't think a 15-year-old today could even imagine what it was like. And I remember seeing a young male with newly diagnosed type 1, and I said, you son of a bitch, you know how lucky you are <laughs> to be diagnosed? i sorry if I can cuss on your show. Uh, and uh, I said, that, I go, that really pisses me off because what what, look what I had. You know, and he laughed, and we both laughed together. But that has come a long way, you know, and I, I would say that, believe it or not, there's been way more changes in terms of, treating type 1s than there has been in type 2s. Type 2s, there's more choices for therapies. 
But type ones, the technology has made a huge difference. And now, you know, Stacey, is just getting that technology paid for, getting it to the patient, and then getting the proper education so you can use those tools uh, to the best, you know, ability that what those tools can give. Well, thanks so much for spending a little bit of time with me. I will definitely have you back on. Um, Love to talk to you more. And I'll see you in Raleigh. I'm going to come out to the conference. I can't wait to learn more. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And just I look forward to being on your show again. More information about Steve Edelman and TCOYD at diabetes-connections.com. And of course, the show notes always have the information that you need. I'm hearing that Apple is making some changes. If you listen on the Apple podcast app, for listeners who use a podcast app, that's probably the number one that our listeners use. So I'm hearing a little bit of blips here and there in terms of what you can see in the show notes. I look at it. It looks okay on my phone, but you know, you never know. So you could always go to the website, diabetes connections Connections.com. Get all the links associated with the show. You may notice we are doing a website redo. So the website looks a little different now, but very fully functional. And you can get all the shows and listen to them right through the website. But I think you're going to really like the changes. Lots of good stuff coming, probably a couple of weeks away. All right. Tell me something good is a big pat on the back and a huge boost for our community from the We Are Not Waiting crowd and the Open Omni Project. They did it. We're going to talk about Omnipod Loop. Tell Me Something Good is brought to you by Real Good Foods, and they are low carb, high in protein. And you know what? They are great people. Here's what I really like about them. The way that we got hooked up with them is that, well, it really all started with this nine-year-old with type one. Uh, the CEO last year got a letter from him, and he, this kid was really thankful and just wanted to say how great the pizza was. You know, he wanted to have a pizza that he could eat with his friends. His parents wanted him to eat lower carb. And the pizzas from Real Good Food have eight carbs in them, which is great, right? So Real Good Foods isn't a diabetes company per se, but that letter made them realize that they wanted to do more in our community. So we were really excited to welcome them on board. And now they're just a staple in my house. You know, we love the pizza, but he loves that Supreme pizza. Unlike that nine-year-old who probably eats it for dinner, that's more of a snack for my kiddo. But we also enjoy the poppers, the new breakfast sandwiches. You know, it's really tasty stuff. And I like that it's in my grocery store freezer. Very convenient. You can also order it online if you want uh, more samples. And depending on your grocery store and your Walmart uh, selection. But it's amazing. They're right there in uh, the Walmart. And my, my Harris Teeter is the one that we find it here in the Charlotte area. Find out more at diabetes-connections.com and click on the Real Good Foods logo. All right, tell me something good. And this is really great. You know, we don't use Omnipod. We don't use Loop. But man, I am always so excited to report these leaps ahead because, and stay with me here, even if you never plan to use a do-it-yourself device, this impact on our community really can't be overstated. The We Are Not Waiting crowd, and you know, we've done so many episodes with these amazing people. It's not a company. I mean, you know, if you listen to the show regularly, this is not a formal company of any sort, but these are people that really work together well in all different aspects. And the point I'm trying to make is that they are pushing commercial industry. They are moving the diabetes technology forward. You know, we are a very small community overall. And I truly believe that without the we are not waiting, I don't know what you want to call them, hackers, that we would not have the tools we have today. And you can kind of smirk at that a little bit. But if you do a little bit of Googling, I'll tell you what, I think Dexcom share would have been a couple of years away. I think the Medtronic closed loop, which was the first FDA hybrid closed loop, right? That's the one that broke the glass and got through. The pushing from the community and showing that it could be done, right? It's like Iron Man. It's like Tony Stark building that stuff in a cave, right? Showing it could be done. Under, you know, in somebody's garage really pushed the FDA and others to see that the commercial industry could move faster and should. So let's talk about Omnipod Loop. Just last week, this was announced and I will link up tons of information in the show notes on the website because this is certainly not my area of expertise, but in a nutshell, Loop is the software. We've talked about it before. It's on your phone. It is an iOS program that is a closed loop. Your CGM talks to your pump. It does the dosing. It does the basal. It does the, you know, the food. You have to tell it a few things, but it is a closed loop. Omnipod is the 
pump, right? It's the tubeless pump. You've seen these. We all know what the Omnipod is. You also need a Riley link. Okay, so the Riley link is another little bit of hardware. And I just learned that Riley is the name of the daughter of the man that who developed this. So Riley Link, got to love this community. You, you know, you have a kid, and you do everything you can to help. Riley Link is really part of the loop system, although it is a separate bit of hardware. If you decide to do this build, you do not need the Omnipod PDM anymore. As they say on the, the frequently asked questions, I love this, pods are monogamous little creatures. They will pair with only one device at a time for safety reasons. And there is obviously a lot more to this and many, many people to name who work tirelessly on this, the Open Omni Project, uh, that James Wedding, who we've talked before, the president of the Night Scout Foundation, he did not develop the Open Omni, but he put up the bounty and was pushing for a lot of this. And as far as I know, his daughter, Carson, is the first person to wear this and kind of test it out. And they've had phenomenal results, as you would expect. So I will link up all the information you will need to know if you are on Omnipod and this is something you'd like to try. If you are interested in Loop, I'll also link back to a couple of episodes we've done on that. Quick note, and here's where it gets a little complicated. All right, so this is a DIY system and you must use the older current Omnipod pods with it. The newer Dash pods that are coming out, or some of you actually may already have, they're not in wide release yet, they are not compatible with this DIY Loop. Tidepool has already started the process, we've mentioned this before, to bring loop through the FDA. And the Tidepool loop will use the dash pods. The big difference there is that the Riley link I mentioned, that separate bit of hardware, that's not required with the Tidepool dash system. So a lot of different things going on here as usual, but I think if you read through the notes, it'll really be apparent. And at bottom line, a lot of people said this would never be done. That Omnipod would never be cracked. You couldn't loop with it. But the perseverance, the hard work, uh, a standing ovation to the We Are Not Waiting crowd, you know, from somebody who doesn't use anything <laughs> that they do. But I, I really respect, admire them. And I think, as I said, the, the impact on our community is absolutely amazing. So thanks so much, guys. I will continue to sing your praises and I hope continue to tell your stories. If you have tell me something good stories, you don't have to invent a DIY loop. <laughs> Let me know. Usually this segment is for things like milestones and diversaries, you know, anything you'd like to celebrate. I'll be posting a new tell me something good uh, solicitation in the Facebook group pretty soon. But we do this every week and I would love to hear from you. Okay, you will not hurt my feelings if you want no spoilers whatsoever for Avengers Endgame. This is where you click off or skip ahead two or three minutes. But I want to talk about it because I've been telling you about how you know the character of the Hulk helped Benny understand his high blood sugars. Because we always told him, look, you can control the Hulk unlike Bruce Banner, right? So you can say, I feel cranky, I feel yucky, I have to... And by control it, I don't mean... Pretend it's not happening. We always meant just remove yourself from the situation. Acknowledge that it's going on. Calm down. Doesn't always work, but it always helped us kind of have the conversation. And it kind of made Hulk a fun mascot in a way, because he was already a favorite in our house, even before diabetes. So when I saw Avengers Endgame, and I saw that Bruce Banner had figured out a way to embrace the Hulk, I told you mild spoilers here, to embrace the Hulk and find a way for those two sides of who he really is to be at peace, I wanted to stand up and cheer because that's my goal for Benny. He cannot take diabetes and pretend it somebody else. He can't take his bad moods and his highs and his lows and push them off on the big green guy. He just can't because it is truly a part of who he is. So the idea that the Hulk, I mean, it sounds silly, but you know what I'm talking about. And you'll see it visually if you watch the movie. I'll I'll hopefully by the time this episode is out, they'll release some stills and I'll try to put those in the Facebook group as well. When you see this character embrace who he is all around, it just works. And I think that if Benny can do that as, you know, as a teen, wow, wouldn't that be great? Who can embrace who they are as a teen anyway, diabetes or not? But as an adult, that would be a dream for me. And I hope. As you listen, if you have type one, that that doesn't sound patronizing. It doesn't sound silly. I haven't written it out. I'm just telling you what's in my heart. I'm going to try to put some thoughts down on paper soon. But man, 
I loved that he embraced the sides of him that he had tried to previously reject and found that he was stronger when he did that. It really spoke to me in a fun way, you know, as in a way a pop culture movie can do, but that probably didn't speak to many other people that way. And by the way, man, it's a great movie, but I don't know if I want to see it again for a while. Some movies you want to see again and again, they're so great. That one whew, wore me out, but I predicted what was going to happen to Steve Rogers. <laughs> I'm so excited. I predicted that. Okay. Great stuff coming up next week. If I ever edit this interview down with Benny, because, oh my God, we did it while we were driving to the Endos and God, he is... 14-year-old boys are tough interviews. Very silly. But I will put that together for next week. We're going to talk about the changes that we made, the results that he got. He has some advice. So very excited about that. Our main guest, though, was on American Idol this year. Jackson Gillis was, um, he didn't make it through all the way to the end, but he made it pretty far. And in addition to having type 1 diabetes, he has a condition called HS. And come to find out, there are a few people with type 1 that I know personally who have this and have never talked about it before. So we're going to talk more about that next week. He's a great guy. It's a really interesting topic. I think he's got a single out this week or next week. So good stuff coming up. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to my editor, John Dukenis from Audio Editing Solutions. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.